Well, good day, gentlemen. I'm Ryan Green here at First Conyers, your Minister of Assimilation. And I'm just blessed and privileged to be able to share with you just for a brief amount of time. Um, so thankful for uh, the Real Momentum Ministry and their leaders. And um, I've had the opportunity to be able to participate when they had the um, revivals. Uh, one was in Covington and the other was in Madison. And so just really excited about what God is doing in the life of men. And today, the topic that we're going to be addressing is a man and his discipleship. And as you know, as a member of First Conyers, discipleship is the heart of our ministry. Uh, our mission is to win, disciple, and send. And it's all about discipling a person, uh, winning a person to Jesus Christ, discipling a person in Jesus Christ, and sending a person for Jesus Christ. And so discipleship is so important. Uh, if you're if you're like me at all, I understand that last year when the pandemic struck, um, it was a paradigm shift for our church, and so it's really important that you know God is bringing us back to the heart of what really matters, and the heart of what really matters is discipleship. It all boils down to are we discipling people? Are we reproducing the life of Christ that we have received into the lives of into the lives of others? And it is so important. You know where that finds the most important. Uh, manifestation and expression is in the lives of men. And so it is absolutely imperative that we as men of God, men of Christ, men of the church, and particularly here, men of First Conyers, that we engage in discipleship. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. I want to, this statement is nothing, absolutely nothing, has the power to transform the world more than discipling men. I mean, think about it. It's the whole mission of what Jesus did. When you read the Gospels, what did Jesus do? Jesus, told, Jesus chose 12 men. He selected, he prayed before the Father, and he selected 12 specific certain men, and he engaged in discipleship with them for just a period of about a three and a half, two and a half, about three years. And these men, after he ascended to the Father, turned what the writer of Acts, Luke says, turned the world upside down. So that's what we want to do. We, it seems like we need to turn the world right side up. <laughs> and so it's really important that we engage in discipleship, the power of what happens when men are discipled in the ways of Christ, in the likeness of Christ. Because at the end of the day, that's what it all boils down to. Are we growing in Christ's likeness? Are we growing in the image of Christ? And are we helping others to do the same? It's personal discipleship as well as discipleship of those that God has chosen um, and, and entrusted within our care. Our families, you don't have to look far. It's our families, it's our children. It's uh, those that God has put in our path to be able to be an influence uh, to and specifically to influence them in the ways of Christ. That's what discipling is. You know, your life matters and the life of Christ in you matters. And it's so important that you can make a difference in just one person. Jesus did not do the most with multitudes, with a whole group of people. So don't be intimidated by, I'm not being, I'm not influential among a great group of people. It's about just, if you can just disciple one person in the ways of Jesus Christ, they will do the rest of the work. They will impart into others. And then that person that they impart to will impart into another. And then it's, got, it's just constant reproduction of the life of Christ. That's what discipleship is all about. Investing in a few who will invest in many. I want to bring your attention to this in our packet uh, or booklet rather, a statement by Dr. Robert Coleman. I actually had the pleasure and the honor of meeting Dr. Robert Coleman, who you would call the Dean of Discipleship. He wrote the classic book, The Master Plan of Evangelism, which is actually the Master Plan of Discipleship. I've had the pleasure of teaching from it and um, had the pleasure of meeting him, but he says this statement, though Jesus did what he could to help the multitudes, he did help the multitudes, he helped great groups of people, and we see that in the Gospels, he primarily devoted himself to a few men, just a few, rather than the masses. He was able to do more with just a select group of men than, in other words, more than just a, a great group. One must decide where he wants his ministry to count, and we all have to make that decision. When, you, when the scripture says, or Jesus admonishes us to um, uh, uh, consider the cost before we engage in something, before what it considers to build something, we also want to know what is the level of our impact. And we always, the world will tell us that impact is measured in numbers, but that's not the way that Jesus sees that. So we want to focus more over quality than quantity. 
um, in the momentary applause. So what, what, what do you decide? Do you want your ministry to count? When it all boils down to it, when we are um, saying your eulogy and you have already gone on to heaven and we're talking about your accomplishments and your legacy that you've left here on earth, do you want it to be said uh, that your ministry counted based on the momentary applause of popular recognition or in the reproduction of his life in a few chosen men who will carry on the work after he is gone. That's a true legacy because applause is fleeting and is very deceptive and it will come and go and pass. But what is lasting, and we as men have to engage in that which is lasting, Jesus chose us to bear fruit that lasts throughout all seasons. And that is reproducing the life of Christ on the inside of us in just a few select chosen men that God has given us who will carry on the work after we are gone. That's a true legacy. And that's something that is available to every single one of us as men. He says, building disciples is not easy. It's not. It's hard. It's messy. It's time consuming. It's, it's inconvenient. But the rewards are, are priceless. It requires constant personal attention, much like a father gives to his children. I was reading a book when I first came on staff here at First Conyers called Disciple Shift by Jim Putnam. And he likens disciplers or disciple makers to like spiritual parents. And some of us just have that natural bend or bent on the inside of us to be able to father individuals. We can use that um, and that gift that God has given us to be able to disciple others. So let's start with this. A man, very simple, a man is a hard thing to reach. I hate to call men a thing, but um, a man is someone who is very hard to reach, especially in these times. Um, we tend to be very defensive. We put up these human defense mechanisms that um, create walls, really prisons around us, and nobody can get in unless we allow them to get in, and that's really just a few people, if that. He says the largest unengaged people group living in America today are men, even though they may be in our worship services, our conferences, our events. Imagine about it. The men who come to church um, they come to church, they attend worship services, but they are not, uh, being, they, they're not being engaged. It's one thing to just, church attendance has its place and it's very important, but that is not the measure of our engagement. The measure of our engagement is discipleship. Anybody can come to a place week in and week out um, and do their little checklist, but are we really engaging in true discipleship? That's the question. While the process is simple enough, Men themselves are quite complex, just the way that we're wired, just the way that they were made up, uh, the way that God has created us. It's very complex, which means we're, we're unique. Complex doesn't always have to be a negative thing. Uh, it's just better to understand ourselves that we're made up of um, what God has put on the inside of us, and we have to understand that. And a lot of that is uh, built in and is seen in view of man and the relationships that define and characterize his life. And you can look at that in 2 Timothy chapter 3, as well as Titus 1. There's four major relationships that, and, and they are in this order. It's so important that we follow it in this order that affect a man. And that is a man and his relationship with God, number one. That is what governs all of our life. If our relationship with God is not right, then everything else in our life will be out of, off kilter and it will be skewed. So a relationship with God and thank God for Jesus Christ because we have, we have placed our faith in him, we have committed to him, our relationship with God is secure and is growing and developing as well. Then there's a man and his relationship with his family, how you treat your spouse and your children. Uh, and if you're single, how those that are in your household or those within your family, those who are close, the relationships that you have. You know, family can be likened because it has so many different looks now. Um, it can be likened basically to the relationships that we have. Man and his relationship with his church, that is so important because in the this, day, this day and time, especially with the pandemic, a lot of people feel as though there's no need for the church. Um, so many, ch we're one of the few churches that actually has live services now and so many people don't put the priority of church attendance, but it's very important that we have a relationship as men with our church. You don't have to, be, you don't have to go to church in order to be saved, but you do have to go to church in order, in order to grow. And church attendance, you know, um, you know, to really to bring it down is that um, justification by the fact that we have received Jesus Christ. We don't have to go to church for that. I wasn't in a church when I, re when I received Jesus Christ. 
I was at home in my bathroom. <laughs> I don't know where you were, but it may not necessarily been within the four walls of a church. But in order for me to grow and be discipled as a Christian, church attendance was absolutely important. So it's absolutely important and a must. It's manly to go to church. It's manly to be able to engage in and be not only to attend church, but also to be involved in the church and to engage in discipleship and you become aware and identify the spiritual gifts that God has given us and to be able to utilize that to bless other people within our church. That's, a, that's, that's the epitome of a man. And then lastly, man and his relationships, relationship to the ends of the earth. That means wherever the Lord takes you, uh, wherever uh, the spheres of influence that you have in your business, um, wherever the Lord takes you in this world, um, that's so very important. Which leads us to Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20, which deals a lot with the Great Commission. It contains the Great Commission, our marching orders for discipling men. When you have an army, when an army is given, uh, the general or whoever is leading that particular army, he gives out marching orders. And each individual who makes up that one army is all supposed to march according to those marching orders. And Jesus Christ has given us our marching orders as men where discipleship is concerned. And he talks about a spiritual reformation. Reformation, when you look at that, examine that word, to reformation, to reform. Um, something was formed before, but now it has to be reformed, uh, reconstructed. It's kind of like if you could take a, a clay, and I know it's hardened, but if somehow we could change the process and bring it back to that state where it was like putty and it's pliable now, you can reform it to make it something else that, that it once was not before. But we need a spiritual reformation. A spiritual reformation of society, the world in which we live, begins with a spiritual reformation of men because men are the leaders we are the leaders of our society and so if the reformation if this society is going to be reformed because now it's deformed if if this society needs to be reformed it's going to start with the men it's going to start with godly men god's men men's ministry discipleship is a grueling process it's grueling uh it, as i said before it's not easy it's messy um we're all in different stages of development. We're all in different stages of where we are in our lives. And God has given us the grace to be able to meet each other where we are. But it's a grueling process. It's not easy. It's not a one-size-fit-all type of process uh, because everyone, each man is unique. And we have to be uh, sensitive to that. It takes a long time to make a disciple. So I don't want you to feel pressured that you know when we're talking about a man and his discipleship, that this is something that you may not already be doing or that um, the results are not as quick as you may seem because to make a disciple takes a lot of time. It's not a microwave activity at all. It's something that takes a lot of time, a lot of personal investment, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears that you invest into a person or a, a small group of people. But it, the, the key word there is it takes time. It takes time. It's not something that just can happen overnight. We're talking about the developing of a life. Um, I'm almost 35 years old, and do you think that I got to where I am um, and how I am now, even in, in, in the development of my life just overnight? Absolutely not. It took 35 years uh, to get to where I am. So it's, it's a steady process, but as you become committed, remember it's not about intensity, it's about commit, co commitment and consistency. Consistency always trumps um, um, uh, see, already in 35 years, almost 35 years, I'm having a senior moment. <laughs> I forgot what I was getting ready to say. But consistency always overrides intensity. We can feel as though we're going so hard on something, and that will easily fizzle out. But when you're consistent and steady, that's, that's what's going to take you all the way. So, as, so likewise in discipleship, we have to be consistent in our efforts where discipleship is concerned not so focused on so much intensity. There may be some growth spurts where we have opportunities where there is an intense moment uh, in our discipling of a person, but the consistency is what carries us throughout the time and also takes the pressure off of you. Live life before a person. Live life with a person. Discipleship is life on life. It's doing life with another person. Being intentional about it, but taking the time because that's what's gonna invest the quality in a person. 
not just getting quick fix results. We're not trying to create robots. We're not trying to create um, anything that doesn't have good value and quality. And it takes time it, to create, to capture, and to sustain. You create. In other words, you've identified the person or persons that you want to disciple, that the Lord has led you to, dis to disciple, because you have to choose and you have to select. And it's a process that takes uh, with, the, with the Father. Jesus prayed before the Father all night before he engaged in the selection process of his disciples. So it's not just arbitrarily choosing somebody, but you want to be very intentional and ask the Father, who do you desire to be entrusted into my, into my care and for me to invest my life in? And then once, you've, once that's been created, then you capture. You capture someone's attention because that's what's going to happen with the people that the Lord has entrusted into your care. And then sustain. It, that's to continue. And that's done with uh, consistency. It can take up to 10 years, 10 years, that's a decade, to build and sustain a successful men's ministry. And that's not just a men's ministry within the local church, but just ministry to men. You know, men need men. Men need to be investing in the lives of other men and being discipled by other men. Here's a quote by a gentleman, Richard Foster. He's a great, um, kind of like a theologian, deals with a lot of soul care and spiritual formation books, um, uh, spiritual discipline. He says, our tendency is to overestimate what we can accomplish in one year, but underestimate what we can accomplish in 10 years. See, it's always what's the quickest. Uh, I got here in this, you know, you see infomercials all the time about how people got their business. You know, I did this in one year's time, but you know, it's always overlooked the accomplishment and the achievement of what was built steadily over a long period of time. And the thing about it is a lot of times those real quick spurts of things, they don't last long and they end up crashing and nobody's heard of it before. But because of something that was built and engaged in with consistency over a long period of time, in this particular case, a decade, 10 years, that's what's going to have lasting staying power. And it's going to have quality that will sustain any attacks. And that's what we want as men. We don't want just the quick fix, the easy way. We want the way that's going to last and which is going to remain. And uh, there are no, none, we can, we can dismiss it from our minds that there are no five easy steps to an effective men's ministry. You see people always doing that, motivational speakers and life coaches trying to present the five steps to this, the, the quickest way to this. Isn't, there is no quick way, there is no microwave way. There are no five easy steps that, to an effective men's ministry. They simply do not exist. And it's a good thing that they don't because anything that you could do in just five steps and get a result is not going to be lasting. It's not going to be quantity, quality. Uh, it's just going to be, you know, very, very superficial. You want something that's deep. You want something that's lasting. And you want something that's going to have continuous impact in the lives of somebody. The discipleship system, there aren't even five hard steps, you know, let alone easy steps. The discipleship system or strategy of your church family as men is perfectly designed to produce the kind of men you have sitting in the pews, children in your home, men in your community. We have the system that we need right here at First Conyers. Um, we have men in this church who are serving in this church, great men of God who have great life experiences and are uh, taking the time to engage in those that God has entrusted into their care. It's just getting in, that, getting in the groove of that community is what, what develops discipleship. So, you know, it's not even difficult. Who are you around? You know, identifying who the Lord has already put you around, people that the Lord has put on your heart to uh, in, 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 um, uh, invest in, you know. It doesn't have to be so deep that we lose sight of what God is showing us right in front of our eyes as far as who we need to disciple. Patrick Morley brings clarity to the deficiency of church ministry to men. He says, I love the church, but the church on the whole has not been able to muster an ongoing will. That's a key there, ongoing, consistency, or comprehensive strategy to disciple men. Comprehensive meaning all-inclusive. It, it, it considers all of the needs of men and then creates a strategy that ministers and, and, and takes into account those needs. Sometimes the strategies that we have, when we don't consider all of the needs of what the men just within our church need, then we can get off on tangents, and then at the end of the day, it's not meeting any needs, so therefore it becomes obsolete and irrelevant. 
uh, pastoring men is not a top priority in any denomination based upon their actual allocations of financial and intellectual resources. You know what they're saying? What he's saying in that statement is you can just look at what a church spends their money on and very seldom do they spend their money on any type of efforts or strategies to minister to men. Um, but with the real momentum and, and the better man, we have been doing those things. Um, hasn't really cost us much, but we have taken the time and the initiative as a church to invest in the men of our church and to build up our men because we know if we have better men, we have a better church. And it all comes through the process of discipleship. Discipling men needs to move from an unusual activity in a few churches to a common characteristic of the life of most churches. You know what he's saying? He's saying men's ministry shouldn't just be uh, seen in just a few churches where it becomes rare. It should be seen something that's common and that's seen in all of the churches that we have because all of our churches should have men. Uh, we thank God for the women in our churches as well, but God has called men to be his sons and to be leaders in, in this church and in, in, his, in his church as a whole. And it needs to be a common characteristic that men are being developed, they're being discipled, and then they're engaging in discipleship as well. That is the key to a healthy church. And you can also look in your personal time. I would encourage you uh, looking in your booklet, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. A gentleman by the name of Mac Brunson says, Too many men are suffering today because of a lack of relationship with wiser, older, godlier men. That is so true. You know, so many times um, we as men, we because we haven't had those relationships or uh, we've been afraid to seek out those relationships or the relationships of, with men that we had were not necessarily godly. You know, um, we, we didn't have the presence of godly men. They taught us things, but it wasn't the ways of Christ. <laughs> um, you know, um, sometimes we will shut down because we don't have those. But when you have the opportunity to be exposed and have a relationship with wiser, godlier men, men who have lived um, before you and have experienced the things that um, you can avoid and, and be able to show you the pitfalls of life, how to avoid them, and not even, not even that, but just how to live a godly life because they have been living it longer than you have and they can share the tips and the ways that the Lord has led them uh, to be able to do so as well. That is a priceless commodity right there to be able to have a relationship with older godly men who have lived this Christ life and are continuing to live it and can help and, uh, invest and engage in us to be able to, the younger men, to do it as well. The devil has a much more effective plan to reach men than do most churches. Wow. Now that is a, that's a mouthful right there. Than most of us. He says that the devil is more adamant about, he has a greater plan to reach men than the church has developed. And of course we know that the devil's plan to reach men is nothing but for destruction. But if the devil is that intentional and adamant about reaching men, how much more, for, 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 for evil, how much more so should we as a church be developing a strategy to reach men for good and godliness? That's very important. A worker in the church is not the same as a discipler of the church. All of us are called to serve in some capacity. All of us have been given spiritual gifts to be able to employ in the service of God's kingdom for the benefit of others, for the edification of the church, and for the most of all, for the glorification of God. Um, but... That's not, that's not the same as discipling. We can serve in church. We can work in the church. That's more, I don't want to say on the, so much on the superficial level, but on the deeper level, discipleship is where you are investing in the life of somebody else. It's not just serving. That has a part of it because servanthood is included in discipleship, but it's not the complete uh, picture. Discipleship is the greater picture where servanthood is a component to it. Uh, discipleship is where we are literally investing in the life in the most intimate, deep way. I'm talking about where what the best way I can articulate it is the way Paul said. He said, I travail with birth pains like a, like a, a mother coming to term in labor with a baby. Why? That Christ may be formed in you. That's what Paul said in Galatians. That I, I am engaging and I am... I am um, working hard and discipling so that Christ may be formed in your life and I'll be able to see and others may be able to see the life of Christ uh, evident in your life. That's what discipleship is all about. That's the whole big picture of what we need to be striving for. 
the hard, cold reality is that we will not see revival in America and the world if effective disciple building of men in churches does not become a priority. Because the revival is going to start with the men of God. But if the men of God are not revived, what, was re what does revival mean? It means to bring back to life. It's kind of like when you have defibrillators of the heart and they do that electric shock and it brings that person back to life. That's a revival. Something was alive but now is dead and it has to be revived. It, has to, it needs to be uh, restored back to life. And it's going to start with the men in our church uh, and, and the men in churches as a whole. When you minister to a man, you also minister to his wife, his future, his children, his future, his church, community, employer, and employers, employees. And that's so important. In just ministering to one man, you have been able to impact all of the relationships. Remember we talked about the fourfold relationships that a man has with God, with family, with his church, and with the ends of the earth. And that includes family, children, all of what encompasses the sphere of his life. When we minister to that one man for good and impact him for the life of Christ, that means once he's impacted, everyone that he comes in contact with and everyone that is connected with him is going to be impacted for the good as well. David Platt says, you don't learn to be a disciple maker while flying to another country. There is no such thing as transformation by aviation. Yeah, you don't have to, of course, mission trips and everything are important, and God may call us to do that. But you can disciple right where you are, and it's all about transformation. We give information, but information is meant to translate into transformation. If what I'm sharing with you or what we're learning doesn't come down to application and where it can be expressed in our life, then it hasn't, it hasn't it's like um, um, when you're doing something online. And it's a, it's a, a, not an assembly line, but a kind of like a timeline. You know, like when you're paying a bill or something online and it'll have the one, two, three, four steps and then it'll, it'll show you where you are on step three. Well, if we haven't gotten to the application process. We got the information. We get understanding. But if we don't understand and if we don't apply it and it can't be seen in our life, that transaction hasn't been completed yet. And so many people stop at the information, but they fail to get to the transformation page. Uh, spiritual reformation of society begins with a spiritual reformation of men. If this society, if this world, and uh, all you have to do is turn on the news and see how deformed that this world is in values, in, in, in um, uh, pursuits, in agendas, in everything that you can think of, it's just completely deformed. If we're going to be reformed, it's going to start with the reformation of the men. And that means that a man, we as men, have to take full responsibility for our discipleship. It, and we, it can't be just a part of our life. It has to be our life in its totality. Everything that we do comes down to the soul, total um, heartbeat of this. A man and his discipleship. So I just would like to offer a prayer for all of our men and for those that are, will be viewing this, and um, just to encourage you that this is what you're already doing. And it doesn't matter what state or stage you may be in. Discipleship doesn't mean that you have to see the first, the whole product, that this person is saved. We can be engaged in a, it, it, just you sharing the gospel is a stage of discipleship. Doesn't mean that they have to accept Christ just yet. Uh, we're not responsible for that anyway. But just by the mere fact that you have taken the initiative, even in this particular mission, local mission that we're doing, uh, to share the cards that has uh, First Conyers information and the truelife.org information, if you go from Outback to Panera Bread, whoever gives you something, you turn around and you give them that card. That's an act of discipleship because you're starting, the, you're starting that wheel of discipleship. You're getting that ball of discipleship rolling. So don't count that out. Don't look for just the full um, um, process being ended. Every step in the process is a step in discipleship. So don't count anything that you're doing or belittle anything that you're doing. Continue to do that and be led of the Lord. And that's what it's all about, a man and his discipleship. So, Father, I thank you so much for this teaching. I thank you so much for, as it's teaching me, I'm able to teach others as well. 
And I thank you that you'll allow us to have this be expressed in our life. Thank you for the men of First Conyers. Thank you that we're men who engage in real momentum and that we're better men because we uh, take and fully embrace the call of discipleship that you have given us. And we thank you so much for your grace that allows us to put people in our path, young and old in our path and seasoned, to be able to disciple and invest in the life of the life of Christ that we have received into them and see them grow and mature. And as a result of that, just impacting that one life will impact all the other lives that they are connected with. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you so much and God bless you.